The region of Russia and its neighboring countries once formed most of the old Soviet Union, or USSR. Many of these old Soviet republics differ from one another on the basis of ethnicity and religion. But within the Russian Federation itself, there are republics that could still fragment along cultural and political lines. One of these is Dagestan. Dagestan's historical and economic geographies help explain opposing centripetal and centrifugal forces within Russia. As a largely Islamic republic adjacent to warring Chechnya, Dagestan now receives new scrutiny in the war on terrorism. To help explain the differences between Chechnya and Dagestan, we explore the relationship between diverse cultures and the physical geography of the Caucasus Mountains. Dagestan, the name means land of mountains. Part of the Russian Federation, Dagestan lies in the Caucasus Mountains on Russia's southern border. Most people here live in small villages that are often very isolated. In the 19th century, when science still believed in distinct races, a German coined the term Caucasians because he thought these beautiful people exemplified all whites. But in recent times, the Caucasus region has received international attention for something far less romantic. Here in neighboring Chechnya, Russian troops and rebel guerrillas have clashed for more than a decade. Along this stretch of Russia's southern border are a string of small republics. Five, including Dagestan, are largely Islamic. The conflict in Chechnya is partly religious, but mostly nationalist, reflecting Chechnya's distaste for Russian control. But Dagestan's case is quite different from that of neighboring Chechnya. Despite similar histories and religion, Dagestan exhibits little of the volatility that characterizes Chechnya. Why is that? Geographers look at places for evidence of two opposing forces. Take the old Soviet Union, military power, communist ideology, and economic integration were centripetal forces that helped hold the Union together. But they were weak, and when the centralized economy proved bankrupt, centrifugal or devolutionary forces proved stronger. Different languages, religions, and large distances helped these areas spin away as in a centrifuge. The new Central Asian republics joined the Slavic countries in the Southern Caucasus to form the Commonwealth of Independent States. But the North Caucasus remained within Russia itself, despite a bloody resistance that goes back to the 19th century. Geographer Ronald Wixman. When the Tsarist government came into the Caucasus, they committed unspeakable brutalities. The Russians literally had to commit genocide, but they couldn't get the people to simply accept Russian rule. The leader of the greatest revolt is Shamil, Shamil the Avar. He unified the entire North Caucasus, which included Chechens, who were Dagestanis at the time, and other peoples to fight the Russian authorities. Shamil led the Caucasians in an epic defensive battle here at Ahogo. Ahogo is the holiest place in Dagestan and for all Muslims of northern Caucasia. This is where the most important battle of the Caucasian war was fought. The Russians assaulted this mountain for three months and could not take it. Three thousand Russians and one thousand people from the mountains died here. Only seven of our mountain people survived the battle. Eventually the Tsarists prevailed, but the Caucasians still dreamed of autonomy. In 1918, Bolshevik revolutionaries exploited Caucasian desires. It began a pattern of betrayal. Lenin lied. He got all Caucasians to support him in the Russian Revolution, and they did. And then, instead of being given a Caucasian Republic, 
they were divided into mini territories that caused a lot of problems. The boundaries were drawn by Joseph Stalin in a classic case of divide and conquer. The Chechens were treated especially brutally. During World War II, the entire Chechen nation was deported to Siberia and to the northern part of Kazakhstan, where somewhere between a third and a half the people died. Therefore, the Chechen bitterness is much greater. Another thing is the Chechens were not permitted to return to their homes, whereas the Dagestanis are living in their traditional homes. So, centrifugal forces pushing the Caucasians away from Moscow were stronger among the Chechens than among the Dagestanis. Still, Dagestani culture had to go underground. Our national traditions were oppressed under socialism. But the people succeeded in keeping their habits and traditions alive. Many of these were almost forgotten. Then, as the Soviet system was collapsing, they were betrayed again. Because many Chechens say that Gorbachev promised that if the North Caucasians helped Russia in the war against Georgia in Abkhazia, where many Chechens fought and died, that they would create a North Caucasian Republic in the same way that they had been promised with Lenin. This never came about. Tired of broken promises, the Chechens began a guerrilla war against the new Russian state in 1994. Another centrifugal force throughout the Caucasus is religion. Unlike most Russians, a majority of the people here are Muslims. And here, location is key. The Caucasus rise on Russia's southern borderlands, the northern edge of the Islamic world. Today, Muslims here construct many new mosques. Despite the violence in Chechnya, Islam, like Dagestan, is multifaceted. When they go to a mosque, we think of them as being fundamentalist Muslims, which is not the case. It's funny that we see Russians going to churches and rebuilding churches, and this is called Russian culture. But when a Dagestani reincorporates part of Islamic culture, now they're called fundamentalist Muslims. In Dagestan, there are also centripetal forces that help hold it together under Moscow's rule. Clues emerge from Dagestan's physical geography and its impact on culture that help make it different than Chechnya. Here are remote mountain peaks and steep walled valleys. The brown lowlands are exceedingly dry and provide a poor basis for farming. But in Dagestan, an increase in altitude brings moisture and green grass. Geographer Ron Wixman. This is one of the few places in the world where people lived high in the mountains because it was the only area where there was enough rainfall to support some agriculture. Up here, sheep and goats support the economy. But the same mountains that provide the rain also thwart travel. Villages within these high mountain valleys have been largely isolated from one another for centuries. In Dagestan, every village is actually a small society in itself. Each has its own distinct cultural tradition, its own craft specialties, the coppersmiths, the goldsmiths, and so on. Most have their own newspapers and journals, printed in different languages, even in different alphabets. These distinct ethnic groups, numbering over three dozen, are referred to as the nationalities. Former Prime Minister Abdurazak Mirzabikov is of Kumik nationality. In our government, you'll find the Vartsi, Darginzi, Lesginis, Kumiks, Lakshi, Ogulsi, Nagaki. Each people requires respect. This is but a necessary condition for conducting normal politics in the Republic. Here, the minister speaks Russian. So do most Dagestanis. In fact, the dozens of languages spoken here are so distinct that many Dagestanis cannot understand each other unless they speak in the common language of the marketplace. That language is Russian. 
So the Russian language is a centripetal force, helping to bind Dagestan to Moscow. By contrast, Chechen solidarity is supported by a common language. 90% of the people there speak Chechen. Another centripetal factor holding Dagestan to Moscow is economic. Dagestan is among the poorest of Russia's republics. One of the things we also need to recognize is that the abject poverty of Dagestan makes them fully aware that they do not have the ability to be independent. They don't have oil as Azerbaijan or Turkmenistan. They don't have anything. They're barren mountain regions with some remote uh, resources that are impossible to take out. In 1994, the average income here was only $49 per person. They simply accept that without Russia, they have no economy at all. Financed by Moscow, this huge dam demonstrates Russia's impact. The construction projects improve the regional road system, provide the villages with electricity and drinking water, and provide jobs for Dagestanis of all ethnic backgrounds. Some 3,000 people work here in Ergani. All Dagestan nationalities are represented. Russians who live in Dagestan also work here. As they work with Moscow to improve their economy, the Dagestanis are also reviving cultural traditions. Stories, dance and religion that had long been repressed under Russian rule. During the Soviet period, no Dagestani or Chechen was permitted to name a street, a village, a public square, a park, or anywhere for any Caucasian national hero that ever fought against the czars. But today, men and women, especially the young generation, study our traditions with great interest. The monument to Shamil commemorating his valor at Ahogo is a tribute to the persistence of cultural and religious values. Now when you consider that they're Muslims and they're forbidden to have pictures in their ma uh, memorials, it shows that Islam as a culture is like Christianity or Judaism as a culture. It bends. In their hearts, most Dagestanis would probably prefer to be politically independent. But common sense and history make them pragmatic. <laughs> We have been part of Russia for more than 100 years. So I cannot imagine the future of Dagestan without Russia. Of course, Dagestan needs certain autonomous rights. But as a whole, it has to be part of the Russian Federation. Without great resources, and with such bloody conflicts in the region, why does Moscow fight so hard to hold the Caucasus when they allowed richer Soviet republics to leave? Wixman thinks it's not about economics. Why give away Azerbaijan with oil to keep Dagestan with, with poverty? It's because in the mind of the Russians, there is a natural border of Russia. And the Caucasian mountains are the natural border of Russia. Therefore, they do not see Dagestan in cultural terms. They see it in purely geographical terms. It is Russia. They will not let Russia go away. So Dagestan maintains its diverse languages and cultures in an isolating and resource-poor environment. If Dagestan were all by itself, centrifugal forces here might make it difficult to unify this area under one state. But Dagestanis can well see the violence and chaos just over their borders in republics that are torn apart by regional and even global conflicts. At least for now, the people of Dagestan choose to follow centripetal forces that hold them together safely within the Russian Federation.